my first question is, you founded the Center of Advanced Hindsight, right? And two of the initiatives are the Common Sense Lab and the Startup Lab. Um, very nice. Uh, can you share with us what are your motivations uh, of starting them? <laughs> yeah. Um, I have always been a bit more interested in the applied side. So I, I value pure academic research. I think it's wonderful. Uh, but for me personally, uh, I just don't have as much patience. <laughs> Right, like uh, good academics say, we'll study something for 20 years, and in 20 years we'll find something, and maybe we'll somebody else will take it and do some something positive in the world. I don't have that patience. You know, sometimes we have good ideas. Think about yourself, right? Uh, you have papers that you say, I wish somebody would have taken that paper and do something with it. Right? We we all have those papers, and uh, when I was younger, I thought that would happen. <laughs> And then I realized it's a little tough. Uh, we, we write papers, and then at the end we say managerial applications, but we don't take those too seriously. Yeah, <laughs> Nobody indeed. does. So, so for me, I try to make changes in the world faster. Uh, so I say we already know something, let's start implementing. So, so sometimes mm -hmm. when I have a good idea, I go to companies and try to push my idea and to say, can we do something with it? Over the years, I've transitioned my research from more academic research to more applied research and uh, my research center, the Center for Advanced Hindsight, to be uh, more applied. And in particular, uh, over the last five years or so, we've, we've focused on questions of financial decision making and health. And we've kind of tried to uh, basically, we're about 40 people in the research center. so. It's, not, it's a relatively large research center, and we, we mostly work on applied projects. So in the financial world, we'll, we go into low-income neighborhoods or financial institutions for low-income people, and we, we go in and we study what's going on, and we propose mechanisms to improve uh, what's happening, getting people to save more, to spend less, or uh, to save for their kids' uh, education. On the health side, we study what's holding people from exercising, taking the medication, eating better, and we try to, to improve things. So, so the center is kind of an umbrella, the Center for Advanced Science is an umbrella for research on health, financial decision making, most in the US, but some uh, outside of the US, uh, some in Europe, some in Africa, and now we hope to start working also here in China. Um, uh, sometimes I start my own startup to take an idea and to make it into a reality. But in the last few years, we also accept startups into the lab. So we say, if you're working in the area of behavioral change and you want to come and hang out with us for a year, submit an application. Mm -hmm. And every year we take a few startups. And mm -hmm. I see startups as a tool to take good ideas and get them out there to the world. And, and we have um, startups that are a good fit with the lab, right? So we don't take anybody. We take things that we already do research on, something we can contribute. They come, they hang out with us for a year. They usually want to stay second year. We usually let them, and we together develop develop their ideas and try to get them, get them out. You have been bringing beauty to the world and uh, enriching people's life, uh, helping them how to make sensible decisions. Uh, very good on that. What is your upcoming innovation uh, on this? So, so first of all, let me say something. I, um, in general, um, I, I look at all the places where I think human potential is much higher than we are experiencing. Uh, I look at this gap and I think about how do we make it smaller. Oh. So if you think about all the waste, uh, time, we waste our time, we waste our health, we waste our money, uh, we waste energy, global warming, mm -hmm. and of course, hate is, is something else. And for all of those, I think that, you know, human potential is very high and what we have right now is, is not that good. And I'm trying to figure out what, how do we use research to, uh, to, narrow, to narrow that gap. And one of the things that I've been interested in the last few years has been um, motivation at the workplace. Um, and Every time I've gone to a company in the US and other countries, never done it in China, 
and have tried to improve motivation, I realize it's really easy. And that actually is quite sad, right? Because it means that if it's easy to improve motivation, it means companies are not doing a good job mm-hmm. at it. And I've been thinking about all the places where, where we're mismanaging human, human motivation. Right? And imagine the gap between what we have to do if we don't want to lose our jobs, right? just the minimum required, and what we could do if we're very excited mm-hmm. about what we do. Right? Let's talk about our jobs as, as teachers, you and me. If we want to teach next semester, we can just take the material from last semester and do very little changes. Uh, if we want to work hard at it, we can look at recent events, we can look at changes, we can update, we can look at the classes again and try to figure out what to, what to do differently. And, and the, this gap is very large between what we have to do and what we could do if we're truly excited about what we're doing. Um, so recently I've been, I've been trying to measure uh, employee motivation and how companies treat their employees. And the dependent measure I used is performance in the stock market. And uh, what I've been able to prove is that companies who treat their employees well on a few key parameters actually are much more profitable in the stock market. Right? And, and uh, the idea is that what, what we should be doing is helping companies invest in human capital. Right? So every CEO that goes on stage says, the quality of my people is the best resources I have. Right? Everybody says that. But then you look at how they look at their employees, and that's not the case. Mm-hmm. Right? If you look at um, the yearly report of companies, every time a company buys a warehouse, it's an investment. Every time they invest in human capital, it's a cost. Right? We don't think about human capital as, as R&D, but it is R&D. Right? That's a, the engine of growth for every company. Um, and I don't know how it is in China, but in the US, I have a feeling that the HR departments, human resources, are kind of at the bottom of the hierarchy. Mm. Right, we did all the companies, right? Mm-hmm. Have, uh, depending on the company, mm-hmm. but you have IT and you have management and you have HR is like together with compliance. They are just about employee benefit. They're not really looking at them mm. as the engine of growth. But mm-hmm. uh, HR is incredibly important in trying to understand people's true motivation. So, and by the way, I don't think it's because people are um, unkind. I think it's just that we don't truly understand motivation. Uh, but and also the you know the world is changing, and the world of uh, difficult production, right? Uh, building roads and trains and so on. Uh, <clears throat> that's a very different world for motivation compared to the motivation of the knowledge economy. Right? All of a sudden, in the knowledge economy, you can find motivation that we used to find only outside of work. Right? People used to work hard hate work and have fun outside of work. But now we can find at work things like a sense of meaning and purpose and competition and fulfillment and teamwork and lots of things are coming in. And if you can harness that, everybody could be better off. So my next kind of big project is to try and improve how companies treat human capital, uh, both because it's morally the right thing to do, but also because uh, it's profitable for companies that need to start thinking about investing in human capital in the right way. If researchers and uh, graduate students who would like to conduct research that uh, similar to what you have been working on, uh, could you give them some advices? So, A, I'm not sure it's good for everybody, right? I think um, I, I chose a more applied approach. Um, I basically, um, you know, lots of academics have a theory that they like. And we, I study this theory, right? Or I study this approach. Um, I just try to make a positive impact. And I care less about, about the theory. And it doesn't fit everybody, right? And I don't think there should be lots of academics like me. I think it's good to have a few 
people like me, but I think overall mm-hmm. academia is great, right? People mm-hmm. should, should do what, mm-hmm. what they're what good they at. Like. And, but if somebody wants to do more, more applied work, I think the first principle is to be open to which opportunities are there. Because, you know, doing, doing field studies take a long time. And if you have an idea of one study that you want to run, it will be really hard for you to find a partner you could run it with. Like, you know, we, I can't run a real study on healthcare or on financial decision making without the help of an institution. Mm-hmm. Right? It's not something I can bring people to the lab and just study it myself. Right? I really need to make a change. You need a partner who, mm-hmm. who has access to, to people. So one, one key is to be open-minded and to say, I want to have an impact on financial decision-making and then look at lots of partners and try to find the opportunity because it's not easy uh, to find a partner who would eventually work for you. We have to be a bit more flexible and find a, a willing partner. And you know, sometimes it's the right company and sometimes it's the right company at the right time and sometimes the right company with the right CEO at the right time and you just have to look for those.